today when we uh, read stories about the Arab-Israeli conflict, it's practically impossible to not read about international law and hear the discourse of international law in those articles and reports. Um, you'll hear terms like collective punishment, indiscriminate attacks on civilians, disproportionate force, sieges, blockades, occupation, apartheid. Um, it's, it's impossible to read something without having one of these phrases utilized. And it's also increasingly impossible, um, not impossible, but unfortunately it's becoming quite ubiquitous, that we're reading stories about Israeli officials who have to cancel their travel plans to Europe for fear that they'll be arrested for war crimes if they go there. Uh, a couple weeks ago, the government had to cancel a strategic dialogue with the UK um, because the government could not guarantee that its officials going to the UK would not be arrested. Now, the strategy to use um, lawfare, and I, I sort of see two aspects to lawfare. There's the um, use of international legal discourse on the one hand, and the other hand using legal frameworks such as courts or the UN or national courts. Um, has been around actually for many decades. Um, it was quite prevalent in the 1970s. Uh, the Arab League and the Islamic regimes in the PLO were quite effective in UN frameworks um, engaging in lawfare, and they worked very closely with the Soviet Union on those tactics. Um, but in the past 10 years or so, the primary drivers of the strategy have actually become um, non-governmental organizations that are claiming the mantle of universal human rights and humanitarian objectives to carry out the strategy. And probably what's most disturbing and surprising about these um, new campaigns taken up by NGOs is that they're carried out um, with the funding from the European Union, many European governments, and prominent foundations like the Open Society Institute from George Soros, the Ford Foundation, and even in some cases the New Israel Fund. Like Human Rights Watch might accuse Israel of war crimes, but yet when they do so, they're not engaging in any sort of real legal analysis to apply that label. They come up with that, um, that they, that's how they want to label the, the tactics. And then they find supposed evidence that will back up that statement. But even in those cases, they aren't really engaging in the analysis that's required under the law. So for instance, in, to have something be war crimes, it's not necessarily that, that civilians have unfortunately been killed. But rather, you need to look at all the circumstances of, uh, let's say, counter-terror operation, uh, what, what knowledge was known to the military commander at the time, um, what were the um, advantages of carrying out a particular attack, where were um, the opponents such as Hamas or Hezbollah located at the time of the attack. So the NGOs involved, when they um, bring up these themes, they don't engage in that type of legal analysis. They simply apply the label. Another common theme that they adopt, uh, groups such as Oxfam, for instance, does this quite often, will say, well, it's okay that Israel is trying to defend its citizens, but they invariably conclude that every method that Israel takes is illegal. And they also don't suggest any realistic alternatives. And some organizations even go so far as to say, not only are Israel's counter-terror operations illegal, attacks on Israeli civilians are actually legal forms of what they call resistance. And there's also many cases against companies or governments doing business with Israel to bolster the BDS movement. Now, to date, all of these cases have been unsuccessful. They've all been dismissed. Um, many of the cases um, have had numerous appeals and gone up to the Supreme Court in Spain, in the UK, in, in um, Canada and those courts have all found that the cases are without merit. But the objective here is for the PR and for the associative impact to have Israel associated with war crimes. And eventually they hope that in the future they, they will have some success. The lawfare strategy, um, beginning at the 2001 UN World Conference Against Racism in Durban, South Africa. So at that event, officials from more than 1,500 NGOs, and we're not just speaking about fringe organizations, fringe Palestinian organizations, but also major global NGO superpowers like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, gathered in an NGO forum and issued a declaration um, where they declared Israel to be a racist and apartheid state, and that was engaging in crimes like crimes against humanity, war crimes, 
ethnic cleansing, and even genocide. And as a result of these supposed crimes that Israel was engaging in, the declaration called for the complete and total isolation of Israel through boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaigns, or BDS, and also um, through the use of courts to establish an international war crimes tribunal against Israelis, or in the absence of that, um, utilizing universal jurisdiction statutes throughout the world to, in their view, punish and hold Israelis accountable for their alleged crimes. So universal jurisdiction uh, has been around really since the 1700s to deal with piracy. It was, it was um, I'd say in the 70s there was a movement to start, um, to start passing these universal jurisdiction statutes to start implementing the International Criminal Court, which is not directly universal jurisdiction, but it's an offshoot of it. And then um, in the late 80s, actually, the International Criminal Court came about um, one of the impetuses for it was that Caribbean countries wanted a court where they could help uh, try drug traffickers because they were unable to do it themselves and they thought that this might be a good way for them to combat that. Then, in, then you had the seminal case in the UK in 1998 against Pinochet and that sort of was the beginning of this movement.